Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 87. Set your life up by your own rules. Tina Fey. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is brought to you by Masterclass.com and what uh, amazing courses that they have from Werner Herzog and from now Aaron Sorkin, Academy Award screenwriter. These two courses, uh, I'm already in the courses and they are ridiculous. Um, so definitely check them out at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Masterclass if you want to go to Werner Herzog's and IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash Sorkin, S-O-R-K-I-N if you want access to to Aaron Sorkin's amazing masterclass. So I wanted to give you guys an update on the crowdfunding campaign for This Is Meg. We are five days out, guys. So again, please, if you are even thinking, even slightly of contributing uh, to the campaign, please head over to thisismeg.com. Don't wait for the last minute. Please help us out. We're, we're so, so close. We're like over 90% there. So we just need a little extra, bu- a little extra push. whatever you guys can donate uh, or contribute to the the cause. That would be amazing. I really, really, really appreciate it. And I want to give a big shout out to all of the This Is Meg contributors that have contributed on Seed and Spark. I really, really, from the bottom of my heart, appreciate it. I've never gone through a crowdfunding campaign before. It has been a heart-wrenching and uh, ups and down roller coaster ride throughout this entire process. So uh, it's emotionally draining. It is a full time job. Uh, and I will be giving you guys a big update uh, later on in future episodes about what we did, how we did it, um, what worked, what didn't work, and uh, how, we, uh, how we're finishing it off. So thank you again, guys. It really means a lot to me and to the whole team at This Is Meg. So you knew it was going to happen sooner or later. I was going to bring the star of This Is Meg onto the show and wanted to do it with five days left in the crowdfunding campaign so you guys can get a taste of the genius that is Jilly Michelle Million. Jilly and I have known each other, as I said before in other past episodes, for almost eight years now, and we've worked on multiple, multiple projects together. And as we are shooting, we're still currently shooting This Is Meg. Even though we're crowdfunding, we already started to shoot some scenes that we're able to shoot with the money that we have. So the stuff that we're bringing back is so remarkable. We're really, really happy with what we're getting. The performances are amazing. The footage looks great. And uh, we talk a lot about the craziness of doing what we're doing, how we're going about creating This Is Meg, what her take was it on it when she first said yes to me, and then how I'm directing it and my process of going through it. So you're going to kind of get a peek, a little inside peek of what it's like to shoot a non-scripted micro-budget feature film with uh, very talented and very seasoned performers working in front of the camera. So without any further ado, I want you to please have a warm welcome for the lovely, the talented Jill Michelle Million. I would like to welcome to the show Miss Jilly Michelle Million. Thank you so much Yay! for coming on the show. <laughs> I appreciate it, Jilly. I, I know I know the crowd, the tribe has seen your face a lot lately. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody yes. wants to know who is the girl behind the poster of This Is Meg. So uh, I wanted to bring you on the show so we can talk a little bit about not only um, This Is Meg, but uh, you've had a very colorful career, and you've gone through a lot of ups and downs, and and uh, I think you, your your whole story is is a wonderful one, and hopefully educational for a lot of people trying to get into the business. So, well, that's like, what I love about this is made because it's so therapeutic. It's <laughs> you know, <laughs> it is it is definitely therapeutic. Yes. Question for both you and I. Yes, um, absolutely, and it and it's also so much fun to. I uh, have these amazing friends of mine that, you know, via text, I can text them and say, I want you to be a part of something really special. 
and they have no idea what it even is. And they say, you got it, whatever you need. I'm right there. It's, it's a really wonderful feeling to, um, to be able to have those kind of relationships. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So let me, let me, uh, let's start, let's take it all the way back, Jill. Ooh, going back in the, the time way, warp. Going Here back in the time warp. How did you, well, first of all, how did you get into the business and what made you want to get into this, this ridiculous business in the oh first Oh my God, place? we're going to go real far back. We're gonna, I mean, it, we're you, know, this is a, you know, we, well, let's try to keep the whole thing under an hour. So <laughs> a reader digest version. We're going to have like part one, part two, part three, part four, part four, part four. Um, I, uh, born and raised in Miami and, uh, I was that little girl that instead of like sneaking out of my room to play with dolls or to do, uh, other mischievous things. I would sneak out of my room and I would watch Carol Burnett and I'd watch Alfred Hitchcock. And I, my, one of my favorite movies was mommy dearest. I loved, um, all about Eve. Um, I love sunset Boulevard. I was such a strange kid. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that was my, my thing. It was like, uh, how do you do what those people are doing in that box? Um, you know, because we didn't have flat screen TVs back then. It looked like a box. And yeah, yes, yes. Uh, you remember, you know, going back, we, going we, back. In the we were in a time when there was no remote controls. Oh, Chile. God. I was my grandpa. I didn't have controls. that. I had we had remote. We had remotes, but they weren't they weren't like what the self sophisticated as it is today. You know, it's now it's all universal remotes and all that kind of stuff. It's not even like, a universal remote anymore. Now it's like, I'll just pull out my iPhone and run right. my computer. Run, run everything. It. Let me you bring it up, Scotty. Bluetooth like, it. it. Exactly. Yeah. Let me Bluetooth it. Okay, we're, so, we're making our sounds, making ourselves sound extremely old. So let's move on. But thank God for Botox. <laughs> thank God. I just want to put that out there. Good. Um, can that be a sponsor, please? You I look would. By the way, you look fantastic for 55. I'm just thank saying. Thank you so much. You I'm 82, look... but it's thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> you look horrible for 20. Fantastic horrible for 85. 20. Yeah. 108. You are just hot. You are so hot. Uh... <laughs> but yeah, I, I just um, always kind of dreamed that's where I'd be. And um after I got my piece of paper from college that my parents were so adamant about, I, I literally gave them the paper and went, here, can I go to L.A. now, please? And that's when I got their blessing. Um, so I came out to Los Angeles and didn't know anybody, uh, stood in line with homeless people for open mics. Um, and and then, you know, increasingly I, I started to get things here and there because I worked really hard. I really dedicated myself and focused, um, and didn't, I didn't get another job. I know I'm not saying that this, everybody should do this, but I lived off my credit cards because that's how crazy I was and how much I believed in myself, but I would cry myself to sleep every night because I was like, do you really believe in yourself? Or are you, are you insane? Mm -hmm. Um, and it paid off though. It did pay off, uh, from there. Um, you know, I had come from a sketch world and theater world, uh, with a theater degree and fell into stand up because stand up was somewhere I could get on stage right away and perform. And that is therapeutic in itself to that immediate gratification of people laughing. You're like, okay, I'm, I'm validated, which in spirituality, you're not supposed to have uh, not care what other people think, but mm -hmm. as an actor and performer, it's very important that other people <laughs> like you. So, <laughs> yep. so that's I've, what I've I met, did. I've met very few actors who don't care what other people think. Exactly. Of I'm always like, when I listen to these uh, spiritual gurus, they're just like with no expectations. And I'm like, but I need them to clap. <laughs> if not, I'm not doing my job. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I don't understand. No, they need to buy tickets. I don't. <laughs> <get it>. like, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so, there, yeah, you always you always kind of um, that's one thing with me. It's always this internal battle of what where's the balance? Where's the balance? And because you hear uh, like the, the, the spiritual gurus say that, but then at the same time, you're like, I got to pay my rent. So we're in a different world. So it's just trying to find the two things and, and matching it. So you're in, I guess, the path of least resistance, you know? Um, but yeah, so from there I, I did stand up and then from stand up, um, I went to Mad TV. Uh, they pretty much followed me for about a year and a half. The producers, I would go back to them like every few months and do my characters and all this. And then finally, the timing was right. 
and uh, they made me an immediate cast member. And nice. all those bills got paid off. <laughs> <laughs> so how long, but from the moment you landed to LA to the point where you got Mad TV, how long was it? It was about three years. That's pretty fast. Yeah, it is pretty fast because again, um, I, I really focused hard. Uh, it wasn't like, I was waiting on the couch, waiting for the phone to ring. No one knew who the heck I was. Mm -hmm. And so I was out every night at the stand-up clubs. I enrolled in the Groundlings and Second City and Improv Olympic. And I was thinking, oh, my God, this is like college. Why didn't I just come here in the first place? Right. You know, but my parents did what they knew. And they didn't know about this world. So, um, you know, more than anything, they wanted me to get married and have kids. And I did the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I also talk about secrets and my family's very, Una secreto. you know, they love their, <laughs> their secrets. And here I am on stage saying everything and they're like, Oh my God, what is happening? Right. <laughs> so, You're like their worst nightmare basically. Oh, totally. Totally. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, my father till this day looks at me with these eyes, like, uh, like, uh, like just, I don't know. When are you going to, when is this going to stop? When is this going to stop? Or he's just like, I don't understand you at all. At all. Different. Yeah. Different. Totally. Like, listen, my father's not too much of a different beast as well. I'm mean, a God bless him. I love him to death and, and he loves me, but he, he's still, it, it's hard for him to grasp. What yeah. <laughs> it's just a different, it's yeah. just a different world for us, especially coming from, you know, Latin uh, Roots, yeah. family and, and my father in growing up in South America, this is, comp this is so wrong. You know what I, where I am. However, uh, a few years ago he had come out to visit me and he gave me one of, in his own approving, provingly way, I guess if that's even a word, I like to make up words. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, he says, you're a very unique and special girl. Wow. Yeah. That and can be taken many different ways. <laughs> Many different ways. I chose to seek it as something beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So that was in my eyes. I was like, okay, he may not ever get me, but at least he's accepting me. And, yeah. um, and that felt really good. Um, cause until this day, he still sees me and that's those big eyes. It's those, I, it's like, what is this little thing here? I don't know. I'll, t I'll tell you the, the, the one story with my, with my dad was, uh, he didn't understand what it was. I was just editing at the time in Miami. And then one day I said, Hey, I'm editing a commercial with Don Francisco. And if, if, if everybody who doesn't know who Don Francisco is, he's like, God, he's like, like the Johnny Carson or the Jay <laughs> Leno or the Dave Letterman all rolled into one of Latin America. He's, yes. he's huge. And I was just doing a commercial with him as an editor. And apparently that was, no matter what else I did in life, I'm like, well, he, he worked with Don Francisco. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's the only thing he could hold on to. The only thing he could grab on to. And I guess your dad's it's, similar in that way. Isn't it so funny? I, I, my dad, um, and this is just a quick story for the audience. I don't know if I told you this. I'm sure I did. But I have to tell the story. My father, when I uh, adopted my dog, Mr. Jack, yes. um, he didn't want me to have a dog because I don't know why he didn't want me to have a dog. And I brought him to Miami, Mr. Jack. And my father was so like, like, why do you have a dog? Come on. You're, you're never even home. You travel and blah, 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 and all this kind of stuff. And it wasn't until I finally said, Dad, do you know who his other grandpa is? And he went, who? And I said, Al Pacino. What do you mean? And Al because I, this. Al Pacino yeah, was his... because I adopted um, Mr. Jack from Beverly D'Angelo. Oh. <laughs> yes. And, and Al like brought him, you know, balloons for his birthday and all kinds of stuff. And That's even though I physically never met Al, he brought it to the house because we had a birthday party for the dogs, like the first year that I adopted uh, uh, Mr. Jack. Uh, uh. And once I told my dad, Al Pacino, he paused and he went, Scarface? <laughs> I, me, that, oh, that is so good. Well, oh, my God. Like, well, and now, then, now and then Mr. Jack is now accepted anywhere we go. So <laughs> he's he's like two 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 people removed from Scarface. Basically. Yeah, the, the grandpas are Al Pacino and my father Carlos Melian. So uh, amazing, absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. But yes, <laughs> that is our Latino roots, ladies and gentlemen. That's uh, and and we could talk for hours about our crazy families. Oh, but, absolutely. Uh, so when you were on Mad TV, you became a regular on Mad TV, uh, and you were the first Latina 
uh, to be a regular on Mad TV. Now, first and first and only. Now we're called the Classics because now they're doing the remake of uh, of Mad TV for CW. Right. But there were other Latins that came on Mad TV, but they were featured. So. Until this day, I can always say I was the first and only Latina cast member on the original Mad TV, which is really a cool thing. Yeah. Um, but again, I was always in wigs. I have this, I call myself the Gary uh, Oldman of comedy uh, <laughs> because <laughs> you put a wig on me or you shoot me in a different angle and I transform. Right. And so I had that thing where after Mad TV was done, um, I... I there was no face recognition. There right. was character recognition. If I told somebody like, oh, I did Britney Spears and Drew Barrymore and, you know, Jennifer Lopez. And I, they go, oh, my gosh. But you couldn't if I was walking on the street, you would never recognize me. Right. Whereas somebody like, you know, a, a dear friend of mine, like a sister is Deborah Wilson. Mm -hmm. And Deborah will walk the street and we cannot go anywhere because she gets stopped left and right mm -hmm. for pictures or whatever. And then she would go, you know, Jill is on Mad TV, too. And they were like, I don't care. Like people were like, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what? So what did you learn from that experience? Because I know that experience was, uh, you know, was the, a, a very big part of your your career path. Yeah, um, I have to say this: it, it was it was like boot camp because being on a sketch show is not like being on a regular sitcom. Um, or a drama or anything like that, because you are fighting for sketches to get in. Um, so we would read like over 50 something sketches on Monday and four get picked. So I was very naive um, because this was my first big show that I was on. I had written, I did m bump up writing for a Nickelodeon live action show prior to that. But this was the first show that I was actually, you know, a cast member on. I was so gung ho. I was so excited. And then it was like high school times a hundred. Mm -hmm. And you would just be like, why didn't that sketch get in? That sketch got in. That's not funny though. And this and that. And then people were like, you know, going back behind your back, this, le and I was not prepared, trained or prepared yeah. to be in that kind of world. And I fell really flat on my face. Um, not as far as my performances are, but as far as my, um, my social life and my off camera, I was kind of depressed because I just didn't know what the heck was going on. And so I, I was in the trenches and it was like boot camp. And when they didn't renew my contract, I was devastated. I was mm. just because here's a dream come true. Here I am doing what I love and it didn't feel good. Um, and so from that experience, I could have gone into a downward spiral, but instead I shifted my focus and really did the work to pull myself out of it. And I got Reno 911 after that. I was recurring on that. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there was, you know, other TV shows, guest star here, there, there, but it wasn't the big, huge paychecks coming in as a series regular all the time. So it kind of forced me, this business forced me to find my balance or quit. And I found a balance. And that's why you see a lot of people drop off the map after a big show because they hadn't found their balance. Mm -hmm. And it in this business is so hardcore. And that's why when I go and I mentor uh, young teenage girls and um, I talk to them, the first thing they say is like, do you have any advice? You know, what's your advice? And I go, you really got to love it. You got to love it so much because it is probably so brutal. one of the hardest businesses to be in because it doesn't matter how talented you are. That's part of it. But it is like having rhino skin because mm -hmm. people beat you up. People that you think are friends are not your friends and all kinds of stuff. So you just got to love it because that's your what's going to keep you steady because everything else comes and goes, comes and goes, comes and goes. And you find awesome gems like, you know, me and you, we've known each other for seven years, but there's times that, you know, I haven't talked to you for months mm -hmm. because I'm on a project, you're on mm -hmm. a project. And then we meet back up and we're like, Hey, what's up? Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a weird world. It's a very, it's not corporate by any means. Oh God, you know? Jesus, are you yeah. kidding me? Can you imagine so, being on a, on set just within the first two minutes of what a grip will tell you? I mean, oh. seriously, you'd be, you'd be slapped with uh, sexual harassment suits left and right in the film industry. I mean, seriously. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's a very, it's, it's, 
total different beast. So if I had any recommendations, recommend recommendations, you like that oh, word? Yeah, that's, nice. a good one. that's a good one. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, but if I had to any recommendations for uh, people that are listening that are in film school or in, in theater, getting their BFAs or even in high school, thinking about going into this business is uh, definitely intern, intern, intern. Yep. Um, relationships mm-hmm. is what this town is about. Um, I find myself always circling back and wanting to work with people that I love that I've worked with in the past that have no ego and that love what they do. And that's what I mean, me and you are trying to do is that that whole thing of, you know, our first feature together like this uh, to create a whole nother group of and I don't want to use this comparison, but it's an example of like Adam Sandler's company where he has all his group of friends or like Will Ferrell's company where he has his group of friends Mm -hmm. and they're constantly pumping out these in the Duplass brothers. They're constantly pumping out these amazing um, projects and all their friends are cast and they're having fun doing what they love. Mm -hmm. So that's my hope and dream. And this is Meg is just like the launch of that um, with you. Yeah, I, I, I hope so as well. I definitely hope so as well. Now, and we met, we met almost eight years ago now when Gosh. I first got to LA. You, I when I was like, 12. When you yeah. were, obviously when you were 12, I met you. <laughs> you um, uh, but, um, you, when we met, um, I think we, did, I met you like three months after I got here. Like I literally, wow, was it that soon? It was literally like you were, I was fresh off the boat. I was wow. still gr- a greenhorn in LA. And then, uh, and then we both got, thrown into that short film that we did uh the Emmett Demas and the Porno Queen uh that's how when we first worked together and uh and then we did we've got we've done we've done a lot of projects since then together here and there over the years right yeah yeah that was and that was a cool experience uh to work with you I think it's also because we both we come from Miami we both come from very similar kind of backgrounds uh and we're both go-getters and hustlers, hustlers, if you hustlers. Will. There you go. I love that. We're a hustler. I'm a hustler, baby. Hey, uh, <laughs> so, every day we're hustling. Hustling, <laughs> hustling. Um, but yeah, it's 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 cool because um we know how to we don't need all the bells and whistles. Uh we can make something look amazing because we're so I I, I don't are we ghetto? Is that no? Like, I, I like I like to call. I, I don't like to say ghetto. I like to say uh, I'm a filmmaker from the streets. There we go. Yeah, we're, filmmaker we're from, from the, the streets. Yeah, from the streets because you're always hustling. Like you know, like you're hustling on the corner, mm-hmm. and you and you're and, and we're street smart, but we understand yeah. what it's like to be up in the, up in the hills, mm-hmm. and, and we can hang up in the hills, and we can also hang. Um, down in the streets if we have to. And I think the ability, it's similar to what Robert Rodriguez did. You know, he he was able to tr- create tremendous amount of production value at little cost because he stripped down the all the bells and whistles. He's like, he looked at these, these huge movies and he's like, why is there 500 people working on this movie? Like, you don't need that many people to make a good movie. Like, a, a lot, I mean, obviously, bigger, you know, $200 million movies and so on. But I'm talking, he's like, he's like, well, I could do this cheaper and I could do this better and and let's just get it done. And that's what he did. And I think that's similar mentality, at least the way I go at it. I think we've taken it to an extreme level with this, is Meg, but we'll get into that <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> later. But uh, real quick, I wanted to ask you, uh, and this is just a question I always had. Um, you do stand up. So I know, and I've worked with a lot of different stand ups. Uh, uh, over the years as well, it takes a tremendous amount of time, doesn't it, to create even something as short as a 30 minute stand up set, right? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, it's really funny when you have people that are doing it for two years and they're like, I'm doing a special. And you just go, hey, more power to you. Go ahead. Uh-huh. Um, it takes 10 years to get your first hour. You need 10 years because you need to be on the road. You need to know. Mm-hmm. What works in Oklahoma may not work in Miami, may not work in Kentucky, may not work in Rhode Island. You got to travel. You got to see what is that universal funny? Where's your voice? You develop a voice. Um, And it doesn't mean like, oh, I can't speak. I have no voice. No, it means literally like there's something that happens to you in a 10 year mark Um, because now I've been doing it for 16 years, but there's a something that just pops that you're now able to write with such a strong, clear voice. Mm -hmm. And it's not just jokey, jokey, 
hack stuff Mm -hmm. because anybody can do that and anybody can do the dirty stuff and the shock stuff. So that's like when I would see some specials that are on, you know, I'm like, eh, you know, and I know it's laughable. It's very funny because a fart is funny. It's hilarious at a table, you know? Yes, of course. But is, does, is that have longevity? Does that, is that a TV show that you want to watch a person just farting for 45 minutes or, you know, an hour? Like, but you can, yeah, but you watch something like Delirious and it still holds today. It still holds today. It's still funny as all hell. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. Cause that's a strong voice, very strong point of view. Mm-hmm. And, um, so that's, so 10 years, it takes about 10 years. You get one hour in about 10 years if you're working really hard. And then from there, you're able to develop like Louis C.K. And, and George Carlin and everybody. They were able to pump out one hour new specials every year because now their voice is so strong and they can just hit the road and just write boom, 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 boom. And you're doing they're doing, you know, how many shows per week. And that's like rehearsal for them. And then by the time, by the time, by the time, time, the, the next, next year comes, they got out hour hour. because they have that entrenched. It's in them now. Um, so. I always, it's always interesting when you, when I watch these competition shows and somebody wins because they got a good three minutes and they can't hold it on the road. They go on the road and they tank when they're doing an hour because they're not funny for an hour. They're funny for 10 minutes. Um, but that's what YouTube has done. There's a good and bad. YouTube is great because you're able to showcase and show off talent that normally people wouldn't see. But at the same time, three minutes doesn't hold up a whole hour in a theater. And you don't you don't want people paying eighty dollars a ticket coming in and watching you breathe for forty five minutes, you know? Right. Right. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so so let's get into this little thing we're doing called This Is Meg. Uh, at what, at what point in my sales pitch to you, did you <laughs> agree to do this as Meg? At what point when that phone call came? Cause I probably, when I called you, I hadn't, I guess we had, I don't know if, I think we had talked probably a, a month or two prior to that. Um, not about this, about other stuff. And I just called you and at what point did you say, yeah, I think I'm going to do this. You know, um, or what was it in the sales pitch that said, yeah, you know, this sounds like a yeah. good idea. <laughs> Alex, I think it was just all timing. It was the perfect timing because we have this thing called pilot season for people that aren't in the industry um, it, and for actors. And pilot season is usually like January through April. Mm-hmm. And you are, as an actor, you're out, oh my gosh, you five times a week, five to six times, maybe a couple times. But if even if you're out going out for these new TV shows, you're I'm in the level where I'm going in for series regular. So the the sides, which are the script that you have to memorize for the audition, is about 12 pages, approximately six to 12 pages. And it's very heavy dialogue. And you're memorizing, you're developing this character. You 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 do your brain is just working so hard. Then you go in and there's the the pressure of hitting it in one uh, one take for the casting director, getting that on camera for the producers. And then there's all these levels. And the next thing you go to go to the producers and the next thing you go to the studio, then the next thing you go for a test deal. And it, it, there's so much that happens that a lot of people don't even understand to get a show on the air. So during this season of pilot season, we're doing all these pilots for all these different networks. And um, I had just, I was so beaten up because I had done this for how many months and I so close, so close on so many projects. And you know what? It was a wonderful pilot season. I lost a huge star names, which is totally fine. Mm-hmm. Got a lot of fans, producers and casting directors. And it was an amazing pilot season for me, but I was exhausted and there was nothing substantial to, to go look at this trophy I got from all this hard work I've done. And so when you called me, I knew that this was something that I could grasp, something that I could actually feel, attain, see a finished product. And it was mine. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh, let's do this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Something that I can actually put love into and then see a final product would be amazing. (laughs) I guess for as an actor, yeah, you you, you put your heart and soul into stuff, but you never get a final product at the end of the day. You don't. Generally, you don't. I mean, you you could so many out there. I never looked at it that way. I guess that's a great point of view because, you know, as a director and as a, I always create, whenever I create, I I have an end product. Yeah, we don't. Yeah, you actors don't. So I guess that's a big plus. (laughs) <laughs> no, it, and it is, this is, that's why it's so wonderful to do these, uh, these, I call them love projects because, um, 
because then it is something that we can actually see and go, I love the work. I mean, I was just talking to Carlos Salas Rocky yesterday. We were talking on the phone and uh, people that are following This Is Meg know that Carlos Salas Rocky is from Reno 911. He's done a lot of other TV shows. And I played a sister on the show. He was Officer Garcia. And he has, he's an iconic, you know, actor in this, in this town. And he said, this is the, fa- his favorite character, Tony Eckhart, that he plays in This Is Meg is his favorite character that he has ever played. And That's it so just, awesome. yeah, it just made my heart melt. And I went, are you serious? And he goes, yeah. And it's because there's a freedom that we're allowing the actors to come in and to play and to take it to the next level that's written on the page. And that as an actor is so rare because we're always constricted to a certain point. And then once you're a Brian Cranston, you know, and or things like that, then it's a different ball game. Mm-hmm. But usually they want you to fit into some kind of box because that's what the writer wants. And then at that point, once you book it, you can develop more with the producers, with the writer, with the director, but it's booking it is what is the pressure that happens. So, um, allowing people to come in and just play is just like, oh my gosh, it's, it's, it feels effortless. And I love that feeling. Well, yeah, that was, I was going to be my next question. Like your experience now working on this, because this is in many ways are, I know this is therapy, as you said earlier, this is therapeutic for you, but it's extremely therapeutic for me as well, because I feel the same freedom that you guys feel, but now I feel it as a director, uh, you know, and as a creator, I just kind of am, it's flowing like but didn't we sit didn't we both sit in the kitchen when we were shooting that scene we looked at each other i'm like are we are we are we really making a feature i know <laughs> like is this are, are we making yeah. is, why is this so easy i don't understand like why haven't we done this how how come we haven't had that 10 of these why hadn't we have 10 of these under our belt like i don't understand i think we i think we had to get beat up i think we had to get beat up to be able to appreciate those this and those moments. Um, cause yeah, in the kitchen. And even when we were, we hiked up to get those beautiful shots oh, of the, it was just a couple days ago. Yeah. It, yeah. My legs still hurt. <laughs> oh, um, everything hurts in my everything life. Hurts. You're actually in shape, Julia. I'm, I'm getting in shape, but it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, I've, I come from the, the Alfred Hitchcock <laughs> school of fitness <laughs> of directors. And I really need to get to the Zack Schneider school of fitness of, of directors. So. Oh my God. But yeah. Yeah. We, that's... We, yeah for the, for the audience, we actually hiked up uh, to the Hollywood sign to get some, um, some shots for, for the movie. And it was my bright idea to go. Cause Jilly was like, well, we could go here or we can go there and get some nice view shots. I'm like, no, it's gotta be the Hollywood sign. <laughs> and it was a three and a half mile hike up and it's up, not like, like a, straight up yeah it's not like a little incline it's like a 45 degree <laughs> incline yes. you know? and we had to bring gear which was yeah, even car- more i'm carrying the gear you're carrying yes and your and your wonderful um niece is helping us daisy oh daisy was amazing she's, she's 14 and that girl was like dun, 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 dun. i was uh, like oh my god slow down, slow down. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she made us feel so old i was like yes. stop it Just slow down Just so we got up th- we got up there and shot these beautiful uh beautiful shots in um in magic hour so it was uh it was just this gorgeous glowing stuff but yeah it was but there was a freedom and by the way that so was much. all all as we call it gorilla mm-hmm. um we we as they say in the business stole the shots uh, we stole those shots and those are beautiful <laughs> shots and and even up there um i remember um and i'll never forget this moment alex after we were done and we looked and the sun was setting and i looked at you and i go we're making our first feature yeah. and it was this talk about bliss. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone talks about bliss. That was a blissful moment for me. And that's when someone says, go to a happy place, I'm going to think of that place right there. Cause it was, Oh, it it was kind of magical because you're literally on the top of Los Angeles. You are literally at, I think one of the highest points, at least from the the viewpoint of Los Angeles at the Hollywood (laughs) sign. And you see all of Los Angeles. You see it's a 360. So you see the valley, you see the west side, you see Century City, you see Santa Monica, you see you see everything. Uh, you can even see Catalina Island on a good day, and you're just sitting there. So you got the Hollywood sign, you've got the sunset coming down. I mean, it is just this 
what, and we had just finished shooting a bunch of stuff, and it was just like this really blissful moment. In pain, mind you, in absolute pain. Um, <laughs> freezing okay. our asses off because the sun was going down, and we really didn't un- really underestimated how cold it got. After oh, it this, got so cold. We're sweating our, our you-know-what's off going up there, but coming down, we were like, just hurry, it's freezing. <laughs> yes. It was so cool. I was like shaking. I think the hairs on my legs grew three inches. It was disgusting. I was like, oh my God. It's a lot of fun. Now, now, what's your experience, I guess, because you've never done a feature like this, or you've never done a feature in, 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 in the first place, but you've never done, uh, I guess this is very non scripted. I mean, have you done a lot of non scripted stuff before? Well, this isn't, again, this isn't, this is my first, uh, this isn't my first feature. It's no, me. No. Yes, producing and writing lead, and starring lead, in yeah the first features um, lead yes yeah I just want the audience to know it's she's like she's done yeah, many I, features she's done many features yes many features in a lot of studio um, films and they you know in studio films you have like fifty takes like first stuff or twenty takes and mm-hmm. there's a lot of bodies and there's a lot of network people and and studio people over people's shoulder like you can't do that can't do this blah 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 mm-hmm. um, but the money's great so you're like I'll do whatever you say. Um, <laughs> Um, where this is just, uh, it's, it's, it's such a freeing experience because now it's actually getting something that you feel, uh, like even when we're doing the takes, it's like, I feel it. Like I looked at you and I go, I feel it. That one, I felt it. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're able to really just dive in, in a deeper level, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, but what was your question? I totally went on a tangent. The non, well, because this is a non-scripted and and, and that's a kind of weird term because it's not non-scripted. It's not like we're just showing up on the day and like, okay, let's make something up. It's called loosely scripted. Yeah. Um, and we, yeah, I'm so used to that. And, and all the players that are in this, uh, in this project are used to it too, because they're hand selected because they're friends of mine and we come from an improv world and curb your enthusiasm, uh, a fat actress, um, a, a pilot I did mud show, uh, Reno nine one one. They're all written in the style. Mm-hmm. And what, what it is, is it, it, it there is a script um, because you need a beginning, middle, and end. You need an act structure. one, act two, act three. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You need a structure. Character, um, right. Characters. You need all of those things. Um, and you need a little bit of dialogue to, you know, to push people into the point of view, um, to guide them. But then you have bullet points. And there's bullet points that you need to meet in that improv or need to hit. And so all these people, all this this cast that's in this film um, are amazing improvisers. They're ridiculous. So I knew I couldn't write better than what's going to come out of their mouth. And that's the beauty of when you do any kind of TV show or film like that is because you trust them so much. And as a performer, to have that kind of trust put on you, you, you step up to the plate and you, it's fearless. Um, and you feel you feel appreciated, so you become even more fearless. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love that Alex and I are you're me and you are like we're right on it. We we both get it, and we have so much appreciation for everybody's performances. And that's what I loved about Reno Nine One One, and that's what I incorporated into this is that on Reno going from Mad, which was very Mad TV, which is very structured and very much you fighting for sketches to get in. Um, going to Reno 911, they literally sometimes would let the camera roll for 45 minutes. And when you were done improvising, they would go, oh my God, that was so great. You were so amazing. Oh my God. Okay. Remember when you said this, this, say those things again, but then do whatever you want and then just go even further, do whatever you want. Okay. You were so awesome. Okay. We're going to start back to one. And you were like, really? Yeah. And you feel like, okay, I'll go, I'll push even more. Like I'll totally give you more. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's such a gratifying, uh, experience as, as a improviser. Um, and not a lot of people can do it. Not a lot of actors can improvise. I I worked with an actor, a very well-known actor once that the director said afterwards, he goes, okay, we got that now do whatever you want. And this actor, every time I would go to improvise, this actor would look at me like a deer in headlights, like, <laughs> oh. and then they would go cut and they go, what happened? And he goes, uh, I didn't know when I should talk. Cause she didn't say it was hilarious. And then that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's when I realized, oh, okay. There's, it's a special quality. <laughs> so. and, I, and I'll tell you what, I think in a lot of ways, I'm, 
and I don't want to say I'm improving as a director, but I'm on the edge uh, a lot with this movie. You know, I, I have a very clear vision of what I want, but the technical aspects of things, I'm definitely on the edge. As you know, I'm doing everything. Oh, everything, yeah. So, uh, I mean, literally everything. And, and uh, even some days I am holding the boom. Um, yes. <laughs> but it's that freeing kind of, I think it's, if I could, if I can make the analogy of what you guys are going through like we'll do whatever you want and you don't have any you don't you know you have a box you got to stay in but within that box you can just have fun and as a director i I, i'm kind of doing that as well i mean i have my shot list i have things that i want to do that day but when we get there i kind of just kind of flow with it i'm like all right let's just grab this over here let's go over here over there and 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 just kind of roll with it and the stuff that we keep bringing back uh is cutting well, which and is, I think which is, that's where the that's where the film magic comes into play. And it's reading on camera because there's a trust behind the scenes that is so special mm-hmm. that what we are shooting, it, you can tell we are having fun. And I think that's what the difference is. Sometimes when you watch a film and you're like, it was good, but I just can't. There's just something about it that doesn't make me love it. Mm-hmm. And I think it's because you can feel the chaos that was behind the scenes and it's so it's so stagnant on screen and the performances feel very tight and almost like a to b to c and we're a to z to t to d to exactly f it doesn't matter yeah right? and it's like and, and i know most people um sorry for the sirens it's oh my gosh it's, we're, sorry, we're live baby we're live we are live <laughs> i'm like could you stop it did you stop stop chasing that i'm recording car? i'm on indie film hustle for god's sake i Everyone am quiet. on a podcast you son of a god <laughs> anyways <laughs> see they stopped see, anyway. there you go perfect <laughs> But yeah, I, I'm, you know, this is, it is a very special, special, uh, environment that we are creating, but again, it's not, um, it's not a foreign environment. It's definitely an environment that I have seen in the past and it works. Um, again, like on Reno, I'm one, I can't say enough about those guys on Reno, the, all those producers, they were just, just, they taught me so much and they actually pulled me out of that kind of a depression that I don't even think they know about that. Um, but because of coming from Mad TV and feeling like, what is this? What it's supposed to be like? And then when I went to Reno, I went, oh no, it's not. That was just <laughs> that show, you know. <laughs> so, but I, I appreciate Mad TV a hundred percent because I, um, it was my boot camp, and I wouldn't have learned those things if I didn't have that experience. No, definitely with without question. Um, and so uh, let's talk a little bit about. Um, the the importance of building uh, relationships in this business because I think we're able to do what we're doing because of our relationships. Yes. Um. Oh, and I had a, I had a thought. That's why I was pausing for a second. I think one of the thing, and I think the audience needs to know this, is the reason why we're going through this process. And it seems like as we're talking, like it seems like it's so effortless. Um, for both Julie and I, and and for the team that we got together to do this. That's experience in years. I mean, yeah. it, it's not like Jilly and I are both 22. No offense to all the 22-year-olds out there. And there are probably geniuses like Orson Welles who made Citizen Kane when he was 23. But right. generally speaking, the experience and just the the confidence I think that you build over time is what gives you the ability to do something like this. Because- yes, I, I absolutely agree. And I, I think that if – you were to come to me five years ago, even, and said, let's do this. I would have been like, no, nah, because it, there's so much, the stakes are so high. And because it's almost second nature to us at this point, mm-hmm. we are able to do a crowdfunding and to know that that those people's monies, whatever they're donating mm-hmm. is not going to waste. We are doing something with that. We're doing mm-hmm. something wonderful with that. Mm-hmm. So, because I, I hate asking people for money, even as a stand up, I always try Ugh. to comp everybody in. I'm always like, you know what? Just don't pay me and let me comp everybody in. I I'm always, I'm that person. I'm that person. I'm wearing a shirt and you go, Oh my God, I love your shirt. I'm like, here, take it. Like, I'm just, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I just, I'm that way. So if I'm going to ask somebody for money, it's because I am doing something really wonderful. I want you to be a part of this and I'm going to show you something great at the end. Um, so 
Definitely, definitely. It's our experience. Um, and just like, I, I, I think the biggest thing too, at least from my point of view, and I know you have this already because of years of stand up and just being a performer, is that confidence. And it took me a long time to get that confidence as a director. And I think you've worked with me as a director for you know, when I got here to LA to the point now. And I'm a little bit different than I was when I directed Emmett. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's just a complete, <laughs> I, I was, I'm a completely different human being. Uh, and I think that just kind of, is something you need to build up. So before, you know, a lot of a lot of people listening to this podcast might say, well, let me just go off and do it. I'm like, you can, absolutely. But understand that the reason why we make it sound as easy as it is is because of just this confidence. And in and, and all honesty, we might fall flat on our face <laughs> at the end of this thing. But no. I, don't, I don't think, but both you and I don't believe we will. You no, it, I mean? that won't, that's not it's even just not, a question. I, I don't no. think it's a question either. No. But just saying, you know... Um, and, well, well, I think also too, and I'm speaking, you know, for me knowing you, uh, you know, for seven years in our, the first project we did, um, in Medimus, um, you know, I remember I, I see the growth that you had where you were very, a technical director, you were working out the technicalities. Um, you were more about the, the shots being set up. Now that's almost second nature to you. That is second nature to you. And now you're able to really work with the actors more. Mm -hmm. And that's for me, that's what I think, a, a incredible director is, is that they have, they already have the techni technical aspect down. That's, that's already given. And then the working with the actors is what makes it special. That's what makes a director soar is when they can bring out performances in an actor and get the trust together that creates magic. And that's what's happening with This Is Meg is the magic is happening because your timing and where you are is so perfect too. Mm -hmm. So yes, these are my friends. I wouldn't bring my friends in with you if I didn't think that, you know, you would, you know, I'd be like, no, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. I guess. But it's also too that it was just such a quick yes that mm -hmm. I just kind of like, oh, okay, I guess it's just the way it rolls. But there's, there was thought behind it. There was definitely total thought, thought because <laughs> I, it's not the, you're not the first director that's come to me that says, Hey, we should do a feature. I got equipment and I, I've been like, no, that's okay. But I know you and I know how far you've gone that I'm, I'm contacting friends that they are doing favors for me, even though they're saying, yes, I'll be there for you. I'm show up for you because I love you. But it's, it's a huge favor because they get paid a lot of money to get to a set you know, uh, we don't even have hair and makeup for them. And they're like, got it. Don't worry about it. You know, <laughs> so it's it's a pretty I'm asking for a favor. And I was waiting to ask for that favor until I knew something was great. So I know this is great. Mm -hmm. So asking for the favor is going to be beneficial not only to me, but to them. And we've already seen that with Jenica and with Carlos coming in the, the scenes that we've shot. They have said, oh, my gosh, this is amazing because the timing was there. You're ready. I'm ready. You know, now the favors get asked and pulled and, you know. And, well, and, and, and the thing is, too, like Jenica and Carlos. But, well, Carlos, we actually wrote more for him mm -hmm. and brought him into another scene. And Jenica was like, is there anything else? Can I come back? Oh, I and love she, her. She's like, is there anything? Can Do you need me for something else? I'm, I'm there. She, she had so much fun doing it. And you told me that Carlos, uh, like, was super, super, super excited to come back and play Tony. Yeah, it was just, it made sense after, you know, we shot his pieces uh, where I'm watching it through the iPad. Um, it made sense that he would come back. And so that was a, a wonderful rewrite for me to do. And he had a he had a stand-up show that night that we were going to, because we had to shoot at night um, for the scene. And he has a stand-up show and he was like, okay, I'm going to cancel it. And he canceled it. And, and he's getting paid more on that stand-up show than he is getting paid uh, with us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that tells you a lot about how much he really likes uh, yeah. the project. And that's all right. Enough about this is Meg. We'll get back oh, to that. Oh, why? I just want to keep talking about this. So uh, you also have a YouTube show called Stop It. Stop It. Stop It with, yeah. Sean, with Sean and I can never pronounce her last name. Polofsky. Polofsky. Yeah. Uh, She'll be in This Is Me she, also. Oh, she's playing your agent. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can't wait to shoot her scenes. Um, can you tell the audience how that came into the world? Well, again, it involves you, which is funny. <laughs> um, I'm I'm not, you know, I'm that generation, which is like the YouTube stuff. It was, it doesn't really, 
it, it doesn't really excite me. Um, it wasn't my world at all. Like, I'm just like, yeah, I watch stuff on YouTube or whatever, but to get a page and to do stuff, I'm like, they can watch me on TV or they can see me in a film. What is this TV you speak of? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Um, you know, but the kids are all on their, on YouTube and everything is quick and fast. And, and, um, so I was like, well, I don't want to do something solo. So I just thought it would be really fun if we did this little web series and me and Sean Polofsky, she's a, a really good friend of mine. I've known her for over 10 years and she's a stand up. She was on Chelsea lately. She's on uh, Parks and Rec, I think, or um, no community. Mm-hmm. And uh, she is she's a riot. She's she so, is, she's, she's, she's such a Jew. She's my token Jew. Yes. I love her. Um, <laughs> What I what, I shouldn't say token. I've got a lot of Jewish friends. <laughs> They're true. all here in LA. Yes. <laughs> in the film business, there's a lot of Jewish people. No. I call myself Ellie Einstein sometimes yes. to get ahead. Yes, uh, of course. But- <laughs> yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> but she is a riot. And I, I just love being with her. And we've known each other for so long that we just said, oh, it makes sense if we did these little uh, stop it. They're like, they're kind of like, we were inspired like by uh, Lewis Black and how he just rants. And he rants when he w- used to rant on um, on uh, John Stewart, you know, the Daily, the Daily Show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we have these things where we take a topic and it's two minutes and we just do these, stop it. And we do all these one liners and we can cut to like different pictures or footage. And it's a blast. It's mm-hmm. really a blast. And it's not anything like, oh, we're hungry for for we got to have these many subscribers, all of that will come because we are just having so much fun doing it Mm -hmm. and it keeps us current and it keeps us writing and it keeps us being quick. And, um, yeah, so it's called stop it and you go to stop it show. So it's like youtube.com backslash stop it show. And we're, we're there. There's a bunch up there right now. I'm taking a break so we can focus on this is Meg, but we'll be back again with some new ones. So send us topics because We'll definitely hit up the topics and we'll give you a a special shout out too. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. And I remember I called you and I yelled at you. I go, Julie, why aren't you on YouTube? Yeah. Like, what is YouTube? No, she didn't say that. No, uh, (laughs) she's like, I was like, I am so busy. Uh, And I just started yelling, like, stop it. You need to do this. Stop it. You got to go on YouTube. Why aren't you making millions of dollars on YouTube right now? And they're so silly. Like, I, we shoot them with our iPhones. They're so silly. Yeah, and I, we just have fun. fun doing them. They're great. So um, uh, can, you, can you talk about what are some of the obstacles you believe artists would throw on, on front of their own path when they're trying to create? Because I think that's something that a lot of people listening would kind of get some benefits from. Because I feel like we, we sabotage ourselves as artists so many times and we throw obstacles in front of ourselves so many times when there's enough in the real world as opposed to just throwing your own stuff on. What do you think are some of those things and, and how do you overcome some of those things? It's amazing that you're asking this question because I was just having this conversation today, um, this morning. And I think the biggest obstacle is looking at the final goal. And if you're looking at, let's say for an actor, you're looking at, I'm going to win an Oscar for you know, best actress. Mm -hmm. Um, that's where you can, you fall flat on your face because if you're not getting there quick enough, you'll fall into depression. You'll fall into all these things. You won't take projects that are, you know, projects that you believe in and love. You'll take projects that have the money and the, the fame attached to it. And you kind of get lost. Um, and then it doesn't happen and people quit. I think that's where people quit. Um, but if you, and I'll give a very clear example of even the film that we're doing right now, cause it's current in my life and I talk about things that are current. <laughs> so, uh, mm-hmm. but like for this is Meg, it's like, yes, we would love distribution and yes, all these things, but then I have to stop myself and go, okay, stop. Let's just make a great film. Every time we're on set, let's be the best we can be in that moment. And it's going to translate. And then from there, once we have it in the can, then we go, okay. Now from there, we go festival circuits, blah, blah, blah. And then from there, everything steps. And if you can detach yourself from the final thing and just stay very present and try to do the best you can in that moment, the other stuff will come. You've already declared it. Mm -hmm. It will come. But if you lose focus on what you're actually doing, it looks like you're trying too hard when you get 
the final thing. I, I've done that with stand up. Um, I've had showcases where they're like, we want three minutes. And that's really hard for a stand up that does an hour on the road. Um, three minutes is like, what? What am I going to talk about? I'm going to breathe and it's going to be over. What do you mean? Mm-hmm. Um, and they go, give us your best three minutes. And I try so hard to like showcase what a sick, my sitcom would be in that three minutes. And it comes off sterile. And I went, why didn't I just talk about my, my family for three minutes? And if I stayed on one subject about my dog and my niece and nephew, it would have been so much more passionate and solid. And they would have heard my voice and I would have been in the moment. And who cares if they know what I do or, or my dad or whatever. I, I just talk about my dog for three minutes and boom, and I'm out. And that would have been wonderful. But we get caught up so much in trying to think what other people want that we lose our passion and what we really want to say. So I think that's, um, I think that's my, my biggest thing. And I, and look, I'm giving the advice and I have to take it every day. I I have to remind myself because I think that's where true happiness exists is actually being in the moment and doing the best that you can possibly in that moment. So with that said, I'd like to, to bring up the Jack, Mr. Jack. (laughs) Um, I'm going to publicly, this is the intervention. (laughs) No more photos on Facebook, please. No. Keep it down to, keep it down to 20 a day. That's all I'm asking is 20 (laughs) a day. Fine. If you guys really do 20 a day. The funny funny thing is if, if, if you guys go to our, um, our crowdfunding campaign page, we have all the actors listed off. They're going to be in it. And Mr. Jack, of course, is in the movie. Why wouldn't he be? And he actually kills it, by the way. The C's have yeah. shot with Mr. Jack. He He's a pro. He's better than a lot of actors I've worked with in my life. He uh, hit his mark every time. He hits time. his mark. He doesn't complain. He's not prima donna. He just does his thing. And, um, and at the bottom, Mr. Jack's it's part of that. And his credits are Jilly's Facebook page, <laughs> which I'm, I'm very upset about because I had to change my banner on Facebook and a lot of my little icons to be, uh, this, this is, is Meg for, uh, for our campaign. Uh, and I'm like, I can't wait to put him back on yeah, once our I campaign understand. is over. I understand. <laughs> I understand Jill. Jill, there's, there's, there's another conversation to be had later off here. <laughs> anyway. So, um, so what is the craziest story that you can share from the road. From the road? Yeah, because I, uh, I, I've i been on the road a little bit, just slightly with some big comics, and okay. I have I have a book. So okay. I can only imagine right. what you I have. have. To, I'm going to say this one just because, again, I again, this is Meg is in my life right now, so I have to talk about it. There's a, a actor that's going to be playing um, a booker in, um, in This Is Meg, and his name is Carlos Oscar. And Carlos Oscar and I... Um, he was the first person that kind of took me under his wing when I started doing stand up, and I opened for him on the road for um, close to a couple years. Um, he's one of he's such a great comic. Him and Carlos Alas Rocky, I learned everything from. They're they're storytellers, and they're just. I would sit in the back and watch them until this day. I would watch both of them every single time because that's how brilliant they are. You know, there's some comics that you're like, yeah, yeah, I know their stuff, and you walk out. But they're they're so great at storytelling that I watch. And Carlos and I, <laughs> so Carlos is playing the booker, so you'll love it. But um, Carlos and I were on the road together and a limo picked us up and because we were doing all these big theaters and everything. And this limo picks us up and out comes, I swear to you, P-I-M-P, pimp, a pimp. Like, he like a had a like purple a pimp suit on. No. Where was this? Yes. What city? What city? Oh, my God. I forgot where we were. Um okay. It had to be, it was one of those small towns because they wanted, I forgot which, where were we? I think it was like Modesto. I think it was Modesto. Okay. Yeah. And um, Pimps in Modesto? Really? (laughs) Okay. I'm talking pimp. Okay. We showed up and this guy, purple pimp suit with the feather in his hat and everything, gold teeth. All right. Comes up to us puts us in this limo. We're like, what is happening? This stretch, crazy looking limo and poked his head in and said, 
you guys, I just want to tell you something, okay? You need anything, anything you need, you just ask me, okay? You need, you need Cristal, I'll get it for you. You need some weed, I can hook that up. You need some weed, I got it, okay? In fact, I got some weed on me right now. Do you guys want to smoke in the car? And we're like, no. And he's like, okay, well, just anything you need, we got it, okay? Oh, my and we got we got to the theater that evening and there was no water there was only crystal <laughs> yes cuz apparently that's what they think comics from LA drink only i think so i and that crystal. we can and we, we were like, we can't drink and do a show. Like, I'm thinking, like, I would be like wasted. There's no way. Like, right. The show's gonna really suck. <laughs> totally. <laughs> totally. Uh, but it was that was uh we still talk about it to this day. You want some weed? <laughs> straight up pimp. Like, you know, wow. I yeah. like and it, what did he own the limo or was he just what was he was the he was the booker oh he was the booker yeah so for the audience the booker are the people who actually book the comics on the road like you Mm -hmm. know they book them on shows and things like that so he was the booker the pimp was the booker the pimp was and who knows if he was a real pimp but he dressed like one wow (laughs) wow it was hilarious there's so many so many crazy stories. We'll have to do another podcast one time where <laughs> just crazy just stories about, from the road. <laughs> oh my god, the experiences that I had. I've lived many lives. Yes, <laughs> I could see that. I could definitely see that. So, um, I asked the same three questions of or same two questions of every guest that comes on. So, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether that be in life or in the business? Wow, this is very Oprah. Um, That's a very Oprah. Are you, if you were a tree, what kind of tree would you? No, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> we repeat it again. What is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the business or in life? I would have to say balance. Okay. Because without good, we can't recognize something bad, and without bad, we can't recognize something good. And to embrace the both is the biggest lesson to be learned, to be polished, to be had, to be everything. And if you can balance that, and that takes every day balancing it, whether it's your whatever meditation you want that to be, whether it's sitting in silence or going for a run or, you know, I don't know, whatever, whatever makes you happy, dance into your favorite song. It's centering yourself constantly and not getting thrown with the seesaw of life. And I think that is the biggest lesson I've learned. And I'm still learning. And I'm still walking through that. And I'm embracing the bad because then I go something good's around the corner. So that's it. And what are your three favorite films of all time? Three favorite films. Oh, my God. Of Does, all time. You just pick three that you really like. Oh, you guys are gonna hate me. Uh, I know, well, they're gonna be. They're gonna be. I don't know. What, what, I, they're uh, crazy. They're. Sure, I'm. Sure. I'm insane. This is true. Okay. Um. I love mommy dearest. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. I love my mommy dearest. Uh-huh. I love wow. Sunset Boulevard. Wow. I, I wow. love. Um. And then I say Blazing Saddles. Okay. Well, Blazing Saddles is yes, is, is amazing. <laughs> So God, Dr. there's my personality for you. Okay. Right there. <laughs> Mommy dearest, Sunset Boulevard and Blazing Saddles. <laughs> so are you ready for your close up? <laughs> Jeez. And I say Madeline Kahn has got to be one of my all time favorites. So, uh, you know, do wow. I, do I, do, when, when you're not doing something right on set, can I just bring out the coat hanger? Is that, <laughs> yes. is that what I should do now? Is, should, is that, that the way it works? I didn't know what, if I needed something to get you to the place, I guess now I know. Just bring out a coat hanger. Uh, say, I'm a gay man at heart too. I can't uh, help it. All gay men love mommy dearest also. <laughs> yeah, apper- apparently. And so everybody knows too, I actually have two aliases that I use on movies like this, which will, they will be making their appearance. Because it gets kind of crazy when you see the credits and it's just the same dude's name again and again and again. So, And I bring this up because you love um, Blazing Saddles. My colorist on this movie will be Mongo Wilder. <laughs> and, nice. Uh, and my, um, my post-production supervisor slash online editor will be uh, Jalapeno Humperdinck. Now, yes. both of them have IMDb's. 
Oh my god! If you look them up, anybody wants to look those up, they are real. These are my aliases for, and they have many credits, by the way. <laughs> so funny. So sometimes they uh, they made appearances on films I didn't want to have my name on. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um so julie where can people find you um you can find me on so- all social media it's jilly online j-i-l-l-y online and that's even my website jillyonline.com mm-hmm. and uh yeah pretty active snapchat i'm not there yet. as active i need to get a little bit more but it's like silly you know it's like i always being a goofball on it but I love my IG. I love my IG. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, Facebook is always really a, a nice, like, you know, more, I feel like it's uh, a little bit more intimate because you actually com- com- you know, have conversation with p- people. But in my Twitter is Julie Online also. Everything. You have a social lot. Social media. And you have a lot of Twitter followers. I do. And apparently a lot of them are foreign. So. Yeah. So <laughs> you're like huge in Morocco. Like, exactly. You know, like huge exactly. in Morocco. Yes. But. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, Jill, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, not only for being on the podcast, but joining me on the crazy train that is This Is Meg. So thank you so much for being on the show. and thank you. Uh, and uh And doing and, and helping me create, uh, well, for us to create our first feature film together. Yay! I hope you guys can see why I decided to cast Miss Million in This Is Meg and uh, make her my star. Because she is a star without question in my eyes. And it's now my job as a director to make sure the rest of the world can see the same thing I do in This Is Meg. So I hope you guys enjoyed that uh, very entertaining and very funny uh, interview with Miss Jilly. So if you guys do want to contribute to This Is Meg, head over to thisismeg.com, and that will be our Seed and Spark campaign where you can contribute anything from 5 bucks to $2 million. Whatever you guys want to contribute, it really uh, help us out a lot. So hope you guys learned a lot about uh, what we're doing, and as we move forward in this process of making the movie... Uh, we will be giving a small little taste of it in the podcast, but to get full access, you'll be able to go to IndieFilmSyndicate.com and uh, sign up for our monthly membership that doesn't just give you access to the micro-budget master class, which shows you how we're making This Is Meg all the way from soup to nuts, um, but also over 40 hours of online courses. Uh, you get access to our community as well as uh, new courses added every month new videos added all the time so you can kind of uh just take your film education up to another level so indiefilmsyndicate.com check it out and of course don't forget to head over to freefilmbook.com that's freefilmbook.com to download your free filmmaking audiobook from audible so guys we're in the home stretch i will talk to you guys next week and we'll have probably one last podcast before the end of the campaign So, again, if you guys can't support us, at least share our content, uh, email your friends, post it on your walls, on your Twitter, Facebook. Just get the word out. Really, really appreciate it. So keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E dot com.